Share Shootout brought to you by Lion of Africa Insurance, ensuring South Africa's future. This is CNBC Africa, first in business worldwide. You're watching your Tuesday fix of stock picking fisticuffs. I'm Bruce Whitfield. You're watching Share Shootout. In the next 30 minutes, our sharp minds are going to be battling it out for the title of Share Shootout King. Our contenders, Gary Boyson from Funani Private Clients and Nick Norman Smith from Lentus Asset Management. They've each picked three shares. Neither knows what is being held by the other. And by the time we come to the end of the game, I've got to ensure that one of them leaves the show, possibly never to return. We send them out into the ether. They've got to accept at least one of their competitors' stocks. And if they accept more than one, well, that makes them a nice person, but not a very clever game player. So if they leave it till the last minute, they may have to pick something they really don't like. Each has got 30 seconds to argue their stock pick. We interrogate their choice, and it either gets shot down or accepted. That's how Share Shootout is played. That's how it is won. And well, it is arguably the meanest, most most vicious and nasty stock picking show on TV. You don't want to miss it. Let the share shootout begin. Nick Norman Smith, pink shirt, you can go first. Um, uh, your 30 seconds on Anglo American. Why? Anglo American, it's a very hated business at the moment. It's uh, been run poorly. Um, it's had a portfolio of assets that hasn't been nearly as good as its big rival, BHP Billiton. What, what that's resulted in is the share price being absolutely smashed. It's trading in multi decade lows below book. It's got platinum, which is actually a fantastic long-term commodity. It's got diamonds, some nice late-stage commodities that will really pick up when um, China moves on to the next phase of, of their development. And uh, yeah, very attractively priced business. Great new CEO um, who's moved in is going to turn things around. Here we go. 30 seconds are up. Now, he talks, he's, he's like throwing swear words at us, Gary, because <laughs> he's going platinum, yeah. which is the, the dirtiest word in commodities mm -hmm. at the moment. And this is diamonds. I mean, yeah. Come on, you must be joking, surely. Yeah, it sounds like our clients have been shooting them down on, on buying Anglo's uh, sort of last four months. But uh, yeah, all the way from what yeah, three hundred down to what? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> two two twenty eight had a little bit of yeah. a bounce. So. But uh, no, definitely, I've got to shoot it down uh, again. Yeah, the platinum, you know, Amplats. Even if we were looking at platinum, we'd still be looking at Impala, the Amplats component, dangerous. Uh, you know, you're looking. Why at is the Amplats component dangerous? Why if, do you use that word? If, if you if you compare Amplats, uh, one obviously you've seen all the strike action mm -hmm. and all that uh, in, in the news, but uh, also they're not spending. The same amount. There's not as much capex uh, on you know expansion, sinking new shafts as there is at Implats. Uh, you know, Implats they they really are just trying to you know downsize, scale back. Uh, Implats at least is still you know looking towards the future. They are still spending. They're still getting shafts. So if there is a supply crunch at any point, uh, Implats is the one that's going to jump. And unless you see a return, uh, you know some sort of uh, jump in the platinum price, neither one is going to run. And if they do start to run, it's going to be Implats. It's not going to be Implats. Okay. What about the argument that you've got Mark Cutifani now in there? He ran and. <laughs> and Gold Ashanti's share price on the day he started was at what it is now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, that's, um, that's more of a factor of the gold market than it was of his chief executiveship. He did some clever things at Anglo Gold Ashanti, probably preserved it from a share price collapse rather than anything else. But surely, market of Kapani's influence at Anglo American has got to be positive. Uh, I think it is. Um, I mean, the market loved it when, when that announcement came out. I think Anglo shot up uh, sort of seven, eight percent on the on the back of that announcement, and it, it is very positive for the company. But uh, you know, one one man can't turn around an entire sector. I mean, you look at the commodity commodities in general. You know, you mentioned China. You know, when China really starts kicking off, you know, China latest latest GDP figures uh, down to seven point seven. I mean, they're struggling. They're really struggling to get mm. that outperformance that that everyone. Let's waiting. give him a chance before we shoot him down properly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's basic supply and demand, platinum. Yeah. There's only one place that you really get. Uh, the world's platinum. 80% is in Southern Africa. So supply and demand is very, very tight. We've seen all the platinum producers um, cutting production and some of the smaller guys shutting down. That has to push the price up because you can't get it anywhere else and it's a very valuable commodity. Okay. Unlike you, iron ore and you, copper. You, you're, arg are you're arguing platinum now, we need to be arguing Anglo-American. Well, okay. that's the key component mm. in, okay. in addressing the, oh, the oh, major right. criticism. Okay. It's also got some other grade. It's got iron ore and it's got copper. And even if you assume much lower co uh, prices for those, which we think they will be much lower, 
the, this business is still, it, it's just priced too. Can attractive. you argue against the fact that there is a big red sale, 40% off sign on the top of Anglo American? Yeah, definitely looking at a value chart. You mentioned, okay, sorry to go back value to the chart. platinum, there but. It's, uh, y you know, you say platinum only comes from South Africa, et cetera, but I mean, the recycling uh, portion of platinum is massive. Recycling? Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of recycling, but this it's is- better, A bit of recycling, you've got the whole- uh, But this is, I mean, the platinum sector is that cyclical lows. Um, people aren't buying cars, uh, Europe, the biggest consumer is under pressure. That will eventually turn. And when it does, um, the, market, the market will come He's back. like the knights that say <laughs> knee in Monty Python. He's not giving up. We've chopped off his legs, we've chopped off his arms. Finally, there'll just be a head protesting. But ultimately, you have the say on this one, Gary Boyson, and you're shooting it um, down. Taking it down. It's a big yeah. value trap, you argue. Definitely. There we go. Sorry, Nick Norman Smith. Despite your passion and impassioned <laughs> pleas for, for mercy, there is no mercy. But hey, you get the next laugh, don't you? Because, Gary Boyson, your 30 seconds on a very a company which produces fantastic products. It is very sexy. I think he actually likes it. Is Richemont. 30 seconds start now. Yeah, I mean, we saw Richemont's numbers come out earlier. It, very, very good set of results. You know, way out from what the market was expecting. Got that 7% jump up. Uh, overall, you know, you look at it, it I mean, I, I don't know why we've got such a huge uh, jump up in it, because if you look at sort of the, the likes of the luxury sales out of Porsche, Bentley in the US, I mean, the rich are still spending a lot of money. And, uh, you know, you're going to see that feed through into, into Richmond sales volumes. Of course, you've also got all the emerging market exposure, all luxury goods correlated very much to, to income growth. And if you're going to, if you need income growth, you're going to have to go to the emerging markets where Richmond is. There we go. Do you like it? Fantastic business, but way too expensive. And um, Gary was just mentioning how Chinese GDP is slowing down. Well, guess where the biggest growth for Richmond is? Yes. It's been in China. So mm -hmm. if you think Chinese GDP is going down, um, then th there could be some serious uh, pressure on that share price. I so I've got nothing against wonderful set of mm. brands, but you're just paying too high price. I price. also wonder how much money the wealthy really have. Not that I'm the wealthy. I went to the cheap rooms in a very nice resort in Mauritius recently, where five years ago, the boutique shop across the road was stocked with the world's best brands, Villebrequin, uh, swimming shorts, and all sorts of things like that. My wife, terribly excited, wanted to get family pairs of expensive swimming shorts, goes into the shop, and the shelves are like pick and pay on a Thursday afternoon. There's not very much on them. Why? Because the wealthy spending patterns have changed. Talk to the hotel management um, in this resort, and they say people are going in through the duty-free, buying the champagne at the duty-free, and coming in, no longer buying it at the dinner table. The wealthy are changing their spending patterns. Isn't that a real concern, Gary? Um, it is. It is a, okay, first, first uh, there's like a few points we need to address there. Okay, the first one is is the the valuation being too expensive. I mean, I think PE what's sitting between seven and nineteen somewhere somewhere. Uh, right? It's nineteen at the moment. Nineteen yeah. at the moment. Our industry average uh, luxury goods across the world twenty three. So it's it is an expensive industry. It doesn't okay. make yeah. much better. But but as I in the sector, it's not it's not expensive. Um, you know, looking okay, like like I said, China also. If you look at Chinese uh, uh, China, at least the Guinea coefficient, you're seeing the wealthier becoming wealthier, the poor becoming poorer. So even if you don't get that income feed through. I mean, the, the rich class in China will still have plenty of bucks to spend, especially when they're getting, you know, they're going to Europe to do their shopping and getting 45% uh, discounts because of the, the quotas and the, um, and at least, uh, you, you know, bringing, in, if they're to import it into China uh, anyway. Yeah, so. Okay. But what about the wealthy spending less? Just that little anecdotal example I gave you. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> wealthy spending less. It's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I don't have the figures uh, yeah. in front of me, but uh, it's, it's, I would, it's I purely I anecdotal. But that's yeah, the thing that I would, scares me. I, yeah, I would have to look at you know general trends in the mm. industry. But I would say you know on the basis, if you look at uh, Richmond's performance through you know sort of uh, uh, 2008 collapse and major recessions, the wealthy don't face the same uh, okay. income crunch that you would uh, in a, in a low LSM. I'm just watching it, and I'm finding that particular phenomenon interesting. Yeah, and Bruce, relative valuations, it's very well. They may be cheaper than the others but you know there were relatively cheaper construction companies um, a couple of years ago <laughs> there were relatively, oh, that's relatively low cheaper blow. commodity low companies blow. this is a big this is a story yeah. and stories mm. kill investors a lot a few years ago commodity super cycle was the big thing and people were paying 500 rand for anglo american yep. we no, weren't it was way too expensive so um, you feel that this is a big story yeah. hey we can invest outside of south africa emerging markets luxury goods rich chinese consumer the story is too good and it's pushed the valuation way above reality you should get down Love Absolutely. the company, love the brands, Fantastic. excellent share, excellent business, gr lousy share. Correct. There we go. Anyway, it's interesting. They've certainly got the spirit of the game going, <laughs> and they're boxing hard. But Gary Boyson's got a long reach. I don't want to watch this. Actually, I do want to watch this boxing game. It can get nice and messy. Let's see, Nick Norman Smith, whether or not he will take <coughs> your second pick, which is a Rand Hedge, massively complicated company. 
that only seven people in the world possibly understand fully. One of them is Marcus Uester. Steindorf, 30 seconds start now. This is a furniture company. Essentially, it makes its furniture in cheap uh, developing markets and sells mostly into Europe now. It made an acquisition in 2011 in the aftermath of the crisis and everyone hating Europe. Paid a decent price for uh, a big European retailer. It's the second biggest furniture retailer in Europe behind IKEA now. Um, very attractively priced company, 7 PE and um, below book value and um, it's got a great property underpin in Europe big big um, valuable property again at a low point in the cycle. Well, there we go a couple of things he says Gary Boyson which you would take a furniture truck and drive straight through but I'm going <laughs> to let you do it rather than me. Um, no well, I don't want to because I actually like it. You like it? Yeah, oh, well I'm going to have to do the dirty work. No, then, it's, it's, it's fine I mean I think yeah I mean it has been under a lot of pressure recently I mean we've seen it uh, just on the trading side and I think that's come from uh, portfolio switch outs. I mean you've got Citibank upgrading it and I think it is a good business like you say the, the, the the obvious uh, you know, driver track through is obviously completely exposed to the European consumer, very, very dangerous. I mean, European growth, you know, sitting at looking at this year, probably going to be around negative 1%. Not, not really the market that I'd want to be investing in. Looking, I'd look more at emerging markets. Yeah, well, you don't like luxury goods because rich people are running a bit of short of cash, but the difference between Richemont and Steinhoff. I guess is purely on price. Well, firstly, it's the price, and secondly, even if you are bearish on Europe, a they're in a category low end, cheap. So if people are under pressure but they still need furniture, they're going to buy a Conforama product or one of the other brands um, quicker than they're going to buy a Richemont brand. Never so sat on a Conforama couch myself, but I'm quite a big fan of IKEA, so I understand that. So th this low, even if th it's in the cheaper segment, the affordable segment, the Kalula.com segment of furniture, uh, well, what Kalula.com used to be, the one that's not the one-time segment, uh, the old. Kalula.com segment of of furniture retail. You don't you 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 don't like it or you do like it? Oh, it's mixed. I, I do like it. I'm, I will shoot it down. Though. I'm going, you I'm are, going to, that's I, I am going to shoot it down. How terribly <laughs> courageous because I've seen his third yeah. pick. Oh, really? Okay. But okay. you shot it down. Yeah. You can't, okay. you, you can't uh, claw it back now. <laughs> um, but sign off is perpetually cheap and it's a question of fully understanding what it is that these guys do. But Bruce, it's a lot clearer to understand now with the recent movement. So okay. if you're saying it's a value trap, everything's in the conglomerate, you're never going to get the value out, you could actually simplify this business quite easily. You could list the European property for a decent sum and the European business, probably those two separately. The, the listed stakes that it's got in, in PSG and um, JD Group and CUP, they could sell those off. And um, you know, suddenly you, you've unlocked the value. But I mean, why? Why? I'd rather buy it at a s significant discount to the sum of the parts and harvest all of the dividends that you're getting. Harvest the dividends and wait patiently for a re-rating of the stock. Absolutely. You may have to wait a while, though. Oh, I'm willing to wait. And what a patient guy he is, Gary Boyson. Your next one. I'd like to really know what this company does. It's a two billion rand market cap called <laughs> Constru Consolidated Infrastructure Group. Sounds fancy. Your 30 seconds of trying to dig yourself out of this hole starts now. <laughs> yeah, sorry, like I said, I was going to throw in one curveball. Uh, yeah, consolidate infrastructure. It's, most of its uh, sort of money comes from, I think it's about 80% of revenue comes from uh, Conco, which is uh, uh, actually doing you know, power lines, substations, that sort of thing. So it's in infrastructure development. Uh, I mean, it's got positive earnings per uh, P of about 14, but the real, the real kicker to this one is the, the new acquisition, which is AES, uh, which is actually a waste solutions company in Angola, which isn't reflecting in their results yet. But very, very attractive, and uh, you know, I think, I think it, again, they work across Africa, and they can make a lot of money in Angola. Okay, there we go. This is so far out of your comfort zone, Robert <laughs> Smith, that you have to shoot it down yeah, anyway. I'll do you know anything about the business? Um, I do, and what concerns me is, ten years ago, Africa was a fantastic place to invest in because no one wanted to touch it. Look, look how well MTN and businesses like that have done. Unfortunately, now everyone's there, and and a lot of these businesses are priced for it. And there's a lot of risk out there. Ask Ask Altec if you saw the oh, massive dreadful, write dreadful, 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 um, dreadful. Adcock have had some problems in Africa. So while there's fantastic opportunity, as always. It's about the price and, and the amount of competition. And competition in Africa is heating up quite significantly. And who doesn't want to be in power and infrastructure in Africa? It's a very, very popular thing. All GE and all of these big multinationals are, are moving in. So there's going to be a large amount of competition. Good point there. How do they then fare against the General Electrics of the world, which just come in with a great big bulldozer and take out any rats and mice competition? Yeah, but exactly. When you're looking at the rats and mice competition, it's, it's not, you know, we can't look at it from a global macro point of view. 
view. You've really got to look at it as what the business is doing now. And I mean, yeah, the 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 Conco, at least they, you know, they have worked in Sudan and they have worked with oil companies. But the, the AES, that's waste management. It's not. It is branching out from just a, a power supply. And that, I mean, you know, it's going to be a huge kicker to their earnings. So it's something like 40% extra revenue coming from there. I mean, that that literally is, uh, you know, taking the mud that comes out of oil uh, rig drilling and and recycling it and actually saying, okay, you know, let's let's you know take this and make that into oil, that into water, and take this into our landfills and and you know like have a hundred. It sounds cleaner. biblical. But it sounds miraculous. But you know, and, like and you look at, like you say, Africa is a developing. It is a de, uh, you know a developing market, but it's a market that uh, you know it, it's taking its next step. It's growing into a maturity, and that's where AES really can move into. Because you know, in the past, you could get away with you know just drilling off to the shore and you, know, you don't really clean it up. It's not really a problem. Now suddenly, there's much more stringent regulations from governments. That's where they're going to take advantage. Do warn me if ever this investing thing goes badly for him and he goes into selling secondhand cars that I shouldn't go and buy one from <laughs> because I'm completely buying it. But is it just another story? You're very cautious the, on stories. Exactly, and, and you know, the waste management, wow, it sounds great. Who doesn't want to, who doesn't want to clean <laughs> that up? But it's a new business. How good are they at it? We don't know. It's a two billion rand market cap company. I don't mind buying small businesses, but that means that if they had one or two hiccups, this thing could uh, go under versus something like Amplats that we talked about but earlier. How do, you they make can any real how do you make any real money in this market? I mean, I, and get that nice bit of growth if you're not taking a little bit of risk in some of the more exciting opportunistic plays on the JC. Because it's all about risk versus reward. If you buy high quality companies at reasonable valuations, over the years you will do better because the problem with a business like that is yes, it could double, but it could go to zero as well. Uh, one of my best examples is a, is a foreign holding, Coca-Cola. During the crisis, we bought Coca-Cola. We got criticized for, this is the most bo dull, boring company. How am I ever going to make any money? That thing doubled over a few years and did better than a lot of the small caps. So you don't have to take risk You're shooting it to down. make money. You're shooting it down. You're shooting it down. <laughs> Whoa, this is getting interesting because we go into the final stretch. And I don't think we've ever had a game like this before where we go into the final stretch where they're obliged to pick each other's, uh, p obliged to pick each other's stocks and try and find some sensible arguments for that one and... Uh, that one, interesting one. We'll be back with Share Shootout in just a moment. We've got Gary Boyson from Bunani and also Nick Norman Smith from Lentus Asset Management playing a high stakes game here on Share Shootout.